design on those levels but but tweak the species and the varieties so that we've got all of those niches filled but you know you can't eat bluebells apparently you can make blues on them but so having that much of a, a plant in our forest system would be fairly pointless and of course you could eat beech moss but i don't know if anyone here has tried to grind up beech moss and make flowers takes a long time. So this is um, an example of the seven layers of the forest garden in our garden. I do apologise for the um, picture quality but you've got trees, you've got shrubs, herbs, ground covers, roots and climbers and they're all edible, medicinal or um, useful in some ways. We also, apart from food and medicines, we also grow um, plants for pollinators to up the productivity, nitrogen fixers, uh, plants for structure. So I'll, sh I'll come to that in a minute. So this is a picture that Mr Burnett will recognise. I'll give you a little bit of a credit there because Graham drew it and I take that with I hope goodwill and his license. <laughs> um, so just explaining how, how you're, you're filling all of the niches from, from the climax canopy all the way down and of course you know in a tropical forest you can cram it all in together so that you're totally you know, you've got everything almost stacked on the vertical underneath each other. And, and that's kind of when you start, you think, oh, that's going to be the ideal. I, I'm going to do that. I'm going to have every niche full. There'll be no room for any, you know, weed species I don't want. But it doesn't work like that. So instead, <coughs> we had to forget all about Kerala and Belize and all these scrummy, warm, subtropical or even Australia, you know, we had to forget about all that marvellous, what Stefan Gaia would call permaculture porn. <laughs> there, are, there is some porn in my garden and that's what I want to share with you. It's like, how can we have permaculture porn in the cool temperate climate? We can, but only a little bit. So, so this is Martin Crawford. Martin Crawford is from the Agroforestry Research Trust in Devon. He is absolute world authority on all the seven, you know, species of plants for all those seven niches um, from the top canopy right down to the root systems. He's researched inexhaustively for over 25 years, he's really remarkable. Um, and then he has plant nursery. So he's been really influential for us. Um, and we've actually bought a fair few plants from him and, and visited him over time. We've just done a book with him uh, called Trees. For gardens, orchards and permaculture. There you go. Trees for gardens, or orchards and permaculture. Um, China and that I hope is the first in a series. So 
and, and I was very happy to see that, you know, we'd been to see him every five years or something. And as our garden grew and developed over time, I was really happy to see that we'd had ideas that we thought that were our ideas. Um, and we went and saw that he'd done the same thing. Because, of course, there are patterns in nature and, and it's our job to interpret those patterns and then plant in those kind of guilds or, or, or ways that replicate natural patterns. So, you know, we're all doing it. Sorry? Oh, good question. Uh, it's, it's mint, but it's got, it's horse mint, but it's got a yellow flower in there. I don't know, do you know what it is, Tim? That's why I brought him no. along for when I don't know things. Um, and this is um, a rhubarb australis. australis. Yeah, a rhubarb australis. So it's like, you know, like, like the English rhubarb, but Australian. So it's on steroids. And, and it's beautifully um, structural. And you see, I think, yeah, big. So, and I feel that our gardens should have an aesthetic and a structural diversity uh, uh, as well as being functional. So this is ground zero. So we didn't, when we bought a house, we didn't have um, a big garden. We had a bit of a paved yard, which is how we bought it um, because um, it was cheaper. <coughs> and uh, so Tim had this dream that we would acquire up to here and that we'd write and badger the landowner until eventually they surrendered and, and let him buy a part of the field as a garden extension. And we managed that in 1994. And I just want you to know that this, underneath this sort of rustic idyll, was a totally ploughed out field. That hedge line was that higher because it had lost that much topsoil. We're on flint and chalk, so it was all subsoil and, and then hard chalk. You dig down in some places that far, six inches that or more, and you'd get a white, bony, in, almost, you know, sometimes you'd have to use a pickaxe to plant a tree. And the, it had, you know, it was, arable crops every year, never rested, and then intensive use of um, chemical fertiliser to keep the system going. There was no biodiversity at all. Obviously, a little bit on this wildlife corridor up here, but, you know, literally the birds didn't sing. It was one of Rachel Carson's silent springs. And this is what it looks... Oh, imagine! Imagine green, lush, that's exactly the same place in about 2008, 2009. So that's 14 years. Um, and, he, and every year the biodiversity increases and increases and so do the yields. So how did we do it? Okay, so here's the man. It's... Um, third of an acre. Yeah, third of an acre. 0.26 hectares, I believe, for Europeans. Um, so how did we do it? 1994, pre, you know, cheap consumer design programs for computers. So we used um, to scale on a grid paper with an overlay, which we learnt from Max Lindiger, how to design on paper. It's very resilient for when we have power down, no computers. And we thought, right, we're going to select all the trees that we want to plant. And we're going to calculate their canopy relative to the scale of the, the template uh, at, at the point of their greatest maturity. And then we're going to, um, to plot them out with blue tack. It's very sophisticated. And actually, it was a really useful way of doing it. So, so you'll see that there's a kind of great big 
bit in the middle that hasn't got trees in it, which is very different to how Graham's garden is. And this is for a, a reason that I will elaborate on. So we, so we had this soil that was like, you know, a wound. And the first thing we did was we covered that wound with a dressing, with a bandage. And it's real ecosystem repair this. We took the most native wildflower species mix that we could find relatively local to us and we just sowed it. We sowed an annual mix mixed with perennials. So not permacultural in terms of edible landscape, although there was some sorrel, but incredibly effective for, for um, you know, binding the patient's wounds. And, and in that ecosystem, it was a real wound, you know, bare skin, very, very sore. And the other thing we did was around all the outside, we planted Hampshire, so local to our county, our region, Hampshire native species mix because there was just no, once that NPK that fertilizer had leached out of the soil there was nothing there to feed the trees so we couldn't plant anything that would have a need for very much food um, so so it was all native species so and, and a mixed native hedge um, and then we mulched it uh, and, and at that time we had nothing, so we, straw is, uh, particularly when it's spoiled, a bit rotten, it's a really good, it's, it's cheap. So we, we took a lot of straw and we mulched all of that hedgerow to keep it going. And we used liquid gold, loads of human urine, mixed with straw. It's, it's very effective, it's very cheap. The beer was expensive, but the production <laughs> was free. <laughs> and then we started planting. So we had the ground covered in, in natives, and we had the hedgerows, which were beginning to be a windbreak. They took some time to establish because the winds were, you know, there was nothing stopping the wind. But we had the beginnings of a microclimate and the beginnings of ecosystem repair. And then we started planting. And of course, you know, we wanted to fit everything in. So we had a big planting day. We got a barrel of beer. We invited all our friends, said, hey, you know, we've got 80 fruit and nut trees. Please come and plant them with us. Um, but before Tim had gone out and he'd got his grid and he'd put bamboos in where every single tree was going because if anyone here has organized community tree planting they'll know that it's like trying to get anarchists in to sort of do something quite complex and actually quite technical um, and, and lots of people who've never planted trees before you know it's recipe for chaos you get all your root stocks mixed up and you're planting your high tree canopy in the wrong place so he, he was very methodical and he, he had a plan and each tree was plotted out according to the canopy at mature stage and it was all on a grid of baler twine. Any of you Brits here, the, the beautiful free resource in our community, baler twine that ties up straw. And he spent two weeks um, wandering around fiddling with bamboo. And I was thinking, what, what's he doing? And actually, he, what he was doing was um, imagining walking underneath the canopy when it was mature and realising that he'd be walking around the garden like this. Because this is the most fundamental mistake that people make in forest gardens. They think, oh yes, I want apricots, I want walnut, I want apple, I want shrubs. Cram them in cram them in and of course if you do that you spend an awful lot of time pruning you have no proper um you don't get the canopy in the sun of each tree you you get diseases you get too many branches that rub and can cause problems for the tree you know generally it's a recipe for an unhealthy garden 
and and you have to in a cool temperate climate you have to give the space you you can't replicate the jungle in quite the same way you need the light because you need the light and you need the wind too you've got all this rain in this temperate rainforest and it makes it it can be moldy so so you're stacking in space and time so you get your all your trees in hopefully at the right distance but of course they're like sticks like this and they're not going to grow like the Belize uh, f food forest in three years time you know they're going to take some of them are going to take 20 years time some of them aren't even going to fruit properly for 15 years so you know you're living with this dream of, of a food forest and and it takes a long time so you then have to stack it and the best way to stack it is to stack it with things like soft fruit and and the faster producing bushes and and then looking at establishing edible ground layers as well and and some of the climbers and while those trees are small that's when you can start running um, the vines up bamboo canes i've never managed you someone here might be better than us but i've never managed to grow successfully an annual climber or a perennial you know like a soft fruit vine up a tree from planting it just below it because the canopy is too dense and the light levels are too low to get that kind of stacking. The only way I've managed to do it is growing something like Oregon grape, which is a thug, up, up bamboo from beyond the tree and then, and then using a branch and tying it on to grow it up. So that's another thing. You know, we have this lovely dream of that wonderful guild of corn, climbing beans and pumpkin brown ground cover in the annual garden and we're trying to translate that kind of romance into the forest perennial garden and my experience is you can't do it in the same way because you have these constraints of heat and light so so we're stacking in time um yes if you speak loudly so they can hear I wonder uh, if you planted any shrubs, um, like if you planted a young standard tree. I was just coming to that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and uh, planting shrubs uh, near to it. Just coming to that. <laughs> okay, so stacking in space and time. So here you've got exactly as you suggested. We've got pears <coughs> and medlar, Turkish medlar, a walnut tree. And they're all mixed up underneath with comfrey and jostaberry um, and the mixed hedge, which is native species mixed with edibles as well. So there's some quite robust um, trees like um, wild plum, Prulus myroballum, um, elderberry, and um, we've, we've had success with growing damson in hedgerows and allowing it to go to standard and wild service tree as well. Um, and then underneath, one of the best things we've found is gooseberries because they can't, they still fruit in low light. So in the earlier times, while these little sticks are, you know, growing, um, we've mulched the ground and then we've infilled with as many different currants as possible. And, and then some like, some dwarf trees, dwarf cherry, and um, another thing that we've used is um, truffle inoculated hazel. And occasionally in the autumn we get on our hands and knee and we pretend to be pigs. Because <laughs> we're after those truffles and we're at the point where they might, they, we might get them but it's very experimental. I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. We also grow a lot of Kentish cob nut. Uh, instead of wild hazelnuts, Kentish cob nut, our favourite species is Maxima because it's really big. It's double the size at least of a, a wild hazelnut. It's really tasty. Um, and we grow them as standards. So we don't let them coppice from the bottom. We cut the, the runners off and we grow them as standard trees. 
and we, we still prune them so that there's enough light in them. Yeah. Okay, so I was, I'm sorry you can't sit, so you have to use your imagination, but, but here we've got um, wild cherry and, and blackthorn and buckthorn and damson and rosa ragusa in a hedgerow and wild plum. Um, but we're also, we're also growing these, um, they're not quite vertical, they're sort of, you know, diagonal um, Oregon grape here um, to, to get the, the berries in the system. But, but I wanted to be keen to say that we think that everyone needs quarter of an acre for a forest garden and we don't. Um, this is, this is a, a we, we have just like a little side alley which is a raised bed and in there we've got Japanese wineberry and the advantage of Japanese wineberry is much smaller than raspberries but they fruit over what six weeks at least six weeks so you get enough for breakfast every day for six weeks rather than you know with a gooseberry bush virtually it appears all in one go and suddenly, you know, what do you do with it all? Well, you make wine, but you've got to have time, particularly if you've got 10 soft fruit bushes and they're all cropping at the same time. So we like these successional cropping species. And we're trying to achieve that with things like apple. So we have about 20 varieties of apple and they start cropping around July and go late into the year. And some of them are not as sweet and tasty, but they store really well. So one apple tree we have is called Hambledon Dezin. And Hambledon, excuse my French, Ham Hambledon is our, the village next to us and Dezin is two years and the reason why this apple tree was popular until refrigeration became fashionable is it stored not just for one winter but for two in the right conditions so if you had a failure um, with your crops the next year for any reason like a late hard frost that killed the the fruit um, you would have at least something in the store and I would recommend to all of you, um, plant one apple tree at least that is local to your village or your, your area in wherever you live in cool temperate climes. Because, you know, it's so important that, you know, that apple tree was local to you traditionally for very good reason. It likes your soil. It likes your climate. And, and, you know, I feel like us, us permies, we need to save our local culture. And that's, as, you know, as much as apple is. But so here, every year there's different layers. So there's, there's berries, you know, up on the vertical and then underneath. This year we're growing squashes underneath it. Um, you know, it depends on the year as to what, what whim takes us. But it's a very small area. And we also have a, a friend who lives in, in the town and he has a whole microforest garden that is literally the length of his fence with espalier fruit, um, some climbing vines and then a, a layer of strawberries underneath. And it keeps him. So, you know, this is an urban strategy on a micro system as well. And so to prove this, this is my greenhouse. It's just six foot by four. Um, it's got an espalier own root peach in it that fruits this year after Tim had pruned and thinned it. We had 60 peaches on it, even though we've had a rubbish summer because it's been quite warm. Um, and we grow lots and lots of herbs as ground cover. And then we grow tomatillos and tomatoes and cucumbers, all the conventional sort of greenhouse stuff that you would expect chilies we grow a lot of chilies in here <coughs> and we have hanging baskets with strawberries and in again we're sort of trying to stack the layers and use the space as much as we can <coughs> rather than thinking that greenhouses just grow tomatoes and it's all mulched with a, a compost um, that we make we actually make it in the greenhouse in a hot bin over winter 
and then empty the hot bin onto the borders because greenhouses are very hungry and the peach tree very productive but very hungry and, and I have written about this before it's the most simple thing and I just want to mention it um, this is a 4,000 year old irrigation system all it is is a porous terracotta pot, pot with a, a wine cork stuffed through the hole at the bottom and, and, and just a plate on the top. It's a reservoir and what happens is you, you plant the pot with a lip just above the, the compost in the greenhouse, buy, buy your plants, fill it up with water, put a lid on it so it doesn't evaporate and, and the plants wrap their roots around the pot and they actually suck the water through the porous terracotta. It's called an ola. Um, it's an African technology, but it's, it's so free um, and it's so useful for greenhouses. This is kind of a permaculture legend from the UK. Um, this was a very early research project by a guy called Michael Gera, who's been for years uh, an assistant editor, uh, a consulting editor for Permaculture magazine. Um, had a really tiny garden in, Ham, uh, in Hertfordshire. Um, he, this is mostly vertical, so this is kind of not quite forest gardening, but I I'm just want to get your heads around the idea of stacking vertical spaces. And so like every sur surface virtually was stacked. And he produced, he, one season, uh, growing season, he weighed everything that he'd produced. He produced 15 metric tons of food equivalent per acre with four hours work a week. So huge output in a really tiny urban, well, small urban garden, just very intensively cultivated and designed. Michael Gera. Yeah. Did he? I think he had a watering can. <laughs> it's a really small garden. Feedback and questions. Um, so just a few of the things that have succeeded for us. So this is um, bamboo. Now in, in warm climates you can grow construction grade bamboo. In the UK you're lucky if it grows much more than that. This is a pronounce it for me, phyllostatches. Phyllostatches, it's an edible um, bamboo. All phyllostatches aren't poisonous, they're edible, but there are some that are sweeter than others, and this is really sweet, this one. Um, in the spring, it, 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 you know, it's, it's a clumper, but it sprouts these fabulously fierce spikes out of the ground, and when it gets to about here, we, we cut them. So we, I, I know that in Australia, bamboo is cut, the runners are cut out to eat them, but we actually cut them above the ground. And um, you peel them, and then literally bamboo shoots. You just cut them, and, it, and it's a lovely, sweet food that we steam them and eat them. If we miss one of the spikes, you know, and you leave it, you turn your back on it for about five minutes, grown two foot, You've got this huge spike, um, and then how much? About two inches. It's about two inches a day. Slight <laughs> exaggeration. He keeps me down to earth, this man. Um, but the idea is, uh, so, so we leave it, and then it, it grows to maturity, and then we, we, we cut them, and we dry them. We dry them flat, and then we use them for structure in the garden. Actually, we've got too much. So we have to, you know, it could be a really good cash crop, actually, for the locality. It adds a kind of slightly exotic feel to the garden, to have this little grove. It's totally low maintenance apart from harvesting. And it's growing next to uh, Marjorie's Plum, which is a late fruiting uh, plum, and Worcesterberry, which is quite a large um, berry bush. And what we're looking for always is like, yeah, you could have two plum trees, but you don't want these trees that all crop at the same time because it's so hard. In a forest garden, it's so hard to manage harvesting. It takes hours, unless you have all your friends around. Hello, you. Sorry, you said it was particularly sweet in 
Yes. I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, forgotten. We've forgotten. That's one of the naughty things. Um, it, it came... No, no, it isn't edgeless. It's not edgeless. It came from Jungle Giants, and they recommend it as one of the sweeter ones, and I really ought to go and look it up. Sorry. OK. I said something about, like, it's nice to have a bit of exotic feel. So, you know, we put the odd thing like yucca in, and I actually put it in just for the structure. And then, of course, a Spanish friend of mine said, but, of course, we eat the flowers. It's traditional... Um, Spanish um, dish and so here we're, we're growing freestanding fig because the, the whole canopy of the garden has created a microclimate, a golden gauge and, and all sorts of berries so it's got this lovely variety of, of leaves and, and colours and shapes. Just quickly there are hundreds of apples this is uh, an apple called George Cave. It really likes chalk. So many things don't like that very alkaline soil. But we also grow things like, on the right hand side is uh, an apple called Bardsey Island and it's really crisp and succulent. We've actually got some um, here that we picked before we came away. And the one on the right is a Swiss variety that uh, Jenny L'Oreal recommended. It's called Red Love and when you cut it all of the flesh is red inside. The bark's red, the leaves are red in spring. It's really high in antioxidants. What? The flowers are red. Everything's red. The, the flowers are red. Yeah. Very interesting for juice producing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Haven't done it yet. But. Haven't done it yet because it's only a baby but, but it's one of our you know, ones. And of course, we have bees in the garden. So we have this wildflower meadow in the centre and then the bees are already habituated to coming into the garden because we're growing flowering bulbs um, and things like wild garlic. So our flowering season for bees starts on warm days from January onwards and goes all the way through to autumn time until the bees are going to sleep so that we're pulling in the pollinators so that in the vegetable garden even you know in the summer you've got a much higher rate of pollination of things like climbing french beans but of course in the spring it's like heaven uh, um, and we found that we've had huge declines in honeybees which is why we brought bees back in in 20 15 years ago we didn't need um, honeybees in the garden for honey because they just came in anyway but lately we've just seen lots and lots of bumblebees species but not enough honeybees and we saw a drop in pollination and of course it's pest predator I'm going to come to that in a minute um, just really quickly um, this is Asian or Nashi pear expensive supermarket sell it it's a piece of cake to grow um, you have to eat it when it's really crisp otherwise it goes mealy it makes a really potent wine um, and you hardly have to do any work with it you know it's you hardly have to even prune it and it's got a small spreading habit so it's good for urban gardens and and i brought this along which um, if anyone's interested in experiencing there's a bit too many of you maybe to well, we'll pass it round. This is one of our favourite trees, which is Nepalese pepper. You, you get quite high when you pick it because it's, quite, it's got this slightly euphoric, intense smell. And um, you, eat the, you grind the, the outer shell. OK. You, you grind the outer shell and you discard the seed. So if anyone wants to try germinating this seed, you know, st stick a little bit in your pocket and take it home and see if you can grow yourself Nepalese pepper. We keep it at about six foot, so we, we prune it. It's got thorns fiercer than, than the fiercest rose bush, so you have to pick it in protective clothing a little bit, thick, thick tweed jacket like a gentleman, um, and gloves. But it is a beautiful tree, it, it, it's got an aesthetic to it, um, and then it has these lovely red berries. It's related to Szechuan. It's, it's, it's related, related to, Szechuan. to Szechuan. It's very similar. And it's a very hardy tree, it will 
tolerate any soil and you can keep it cut back to any size you like. It's, it's very tolerant of anything you can throw at it. So you could hedge it? I, I don't know, but I guess It's so. so thorny though. You'd have to deal with cutting a very thorny hedge. Yeah. So there's so much that we can grow. We can, we can grow fig freestanding as long as you've got a microclimate. We, we're growing walnuts, Russian olives, Juneberry and Saskatoons, but on chalk, really unsuccessful. We can't grow quince at all on chalk. We're just experimenting my last attempt with Japanese quince, but all other quinces don't work. I, if you've got a less alkaline soil, you'll probably succeed. And things like the Himala another Himalayan tree, Chinese dogwood, which has got a little green fruit, and it's very beautiful, but we're, it's yet to fruit for us to, for us to say yes it's yummy uh, watch this space so looking at himalayan species that like intense cold but so are hardy but crop soon enough in an english summer to have value californian um varieties or of trees more difficult because we just don't have the length of season okay the last thing I wanted to say was, you know, people look at our, our forest garden and think, well, you know, why haven't you put trees in the middle? And you remember the little horseshoe shape. Well, the idea is that the sun crosses the garden on a vertical through most of the seasons. So we have this canopy from low rootstocks right up to the top canopy. And it means that the sun is crossing across and, and is penetrating all the levels of the forest garden. And then next to it is this wildflower meadow. And we grow lots and lots of chalk downland species. And it, there's its habitat. So it's habitat for lizards um, and slow worms, toads, frogs, all those guys that come along and eat um, slugs in, in the raised bed no dig garden area uh, and around the trees and in the forest garden. Um, it brings in loads and loads of insect life so it, it increases pollination but we don't have a codling moth anywhere in sight. We don't even think about codling moths, it just doesn't exist in our, in our world because all those insects are bringing bats in every evening who are harvesting the insects. And, and the birds are coming in, all the, all the insect-eating birds are coming in and they're eating the guys that we don't particularly want to um, have too high a population of. So there's a real ecological balance through biodiversity and it means that it's not even an organic garden, it's just totally out of that way of thinking. You know, Graham Bell said something at IPC about companion planting. You know, do you do companion planting marigolds next to beans or something? Uh, the whole thing is a huge web of interrelationship and companion. And the wildflowers, like, like this engine of biodiversity that's just pulling all the species in and creating this sense of balance um, and ecological stability. So we have lots of li yields. We have lots of ponds. Ponds are really important for growing your own fertility because they, nature loves silting them up and then you've got loads of guck and you have to harvest it out and then it's really useful for mulching trees with when you've got too much weed. Um, so that's an example. And then we've got tiny, more sort of urban area on the patio for ponds. Um, and then things like, this is actually a bath sunk into the ground that's a pond. You'd never know it was a, a tub, a bathtub, um, because it's, it's gone. You know, it's, nature's colonised it. So, in essence, you've got tree... We, we're designing for greater amounts of light. We're designing for microclimates. We're designing in as much habitat as possible. We're designing in as much biodiversity and we're always looking for the plants that like their niche and what, what grows well underneath them. So things like marjoram and comfrey and Nepalese raspberry and wild garlic and wild strawberries as ground layer. That's something in here. Yeah, 
So, so that is in essence kind of a, a bit of a fast summary of, of how the garden's designed and, and how it works. And Tim just wants to say something. Yeah, um, we did an awful lot of experimenting. Um, like, we didn't entirely know what we were doing right at the beginning. And there weren't any books on uh, temperate climate. Uh, there weren't any books on temperate climate permaculture available at that time, um, which is why we got round to publishing some, uh, or quite a lot actually. Um, so um, yeah, there were things we did that just simply didn't work. So the bulk of all those trees got planted, I think it was in 1995-96, um, and some things didn't work. And some things we planted almonds because Martin Crawford back then thought the climate might have changed enough for, for, for the climate in uh, southern England to be good enough for almonds. Um, Patrick Whitefield said, no, I don't think so. And Patrick <laughs> Whitefield won that one. Um, they, they, the, the almond trees grew but got peach leaf curl and we struggled with them. We got little crops off them from time to time. But in the end, I took that out. I had a pear tree that would had a lovely shape and looked gorgeous, <coughs> but it never produced any fruit. And then after 15 years, it produced a massive amount of fruit, and it was disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> so that came out. <laughs> and something else went in, which is just as well, because Maddie keeps finding new trees that she wants to grow. So, <laughs> so there are some trees that have been there since 1995, or whenever it was. And, well, most of them have, actually, probably 70 or more percent. Um, but there are other things that have, have outlived their usefulness, were never really that useful, or just outright failures. And so we've got lots of different um, ages of, of trees. Um, but bit by bit by bit, you know, we're eventually, we are finally sort of getting to the point where most of what is there is what wants to be there. It's, it's found its own level, it's found its own, own niche. So, I mean, we followed certain principles, but basically we had a lot of fun experimenting along the way and had failures, learnt lessons. Um, but uh, so if, you, if you're going to do uh, a, a forest garden, then don't be afraid to experiment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, so we've got 10 minutes. Um, we could do questions, um, if you like. There's some Nepalese pepper wandering around. Um, if it comes to you, give it a sniff. If you dare, put one of the little corns on your tongue, one of the husks. Not Don't the try and crunch the seed. It's like hard. a little tiny ball bearing. It's a monster. It's um, like but, but just taste the husk because it's got this slightly anaesthetic feel to it and and as I said when you harvest it it makes you a little bit euphoric it's rather love jolly stuff but you can cook with it as well and you know um, and if you want to put a few seeds in your pocket and go home and try and germinate them um, stick them in the fridge when you get home and then um, and actually you could just look up um, germinating Nepalese pepper and you'll get some instructions but it's good to scarify it first. Um, Mark Diacono from Otter Farm, um, he, he grows Nepalese raspberry but he's particularly keen on Szechuan pepper, the pepper, yeah. Szechuan pepper which is related to it and um, he actually has an orchard of Szechuan peppers and he goes around, they, the, 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 the corn's grow on, on little fronds so you pick a frond and he picks it and thinks, five pounds, 10 pounds, 15 pounds. It's a fantastic cash crop if you've got restaurant outlets. And uh, it's, uh, you know, yeah. well sought after. Yeah. And, and if anyone wants to come and see Martin's book or come and have a chat to us, we're going to go to our bookshop in the marketplace afterwards and we'll be hanging around there a fair bit tomorrow as well. And we're very happy to talk specific varieties and Google Latin and things like that if anyone wants more details. Hello. Yeah, I have two questions. I mean, uh, what, what, is the, what is the main work you're putting in to prove the main work you're putting in? Okay, that's a great question. And okay. How much is that work? Okay, so... Can you speak up? Can you speak up? 
Yes. Okay. okay, so the question was, what, what work do you actually do in this forest garden? So, uh, yes, it's much less intensive, obviously, than even raised bed, no dig. Um, how long does it take you to prune and how many takes, trees? We've probably... How many trees have you got? Probably got about 70 trees now, and some of them are quite big. I mean, some of them are like 15 feet tall, and I, I probably spend about two days a year pruning. So two days a year. And it is quite tiring. It is quite tiring. We have division of labour in the forest garden, so there's no marital discord. So, you know, this is my other advice. If you've got a, a, a partnership forest garden, divide up who does what. <laughs> He's in charge of pruning. <laughs> I'm in charge of acquiring trees and trying to squeeze them in. <laughs> And I keep saying, I can't fit that in. And I'm in charge of planting trees <laughs> in chalk. Oh, OK. So, so we have to cut the meadow. We have to scythe the meadow. So we scythe. We've got a spring and summer meadow area. So the spring meadow gets scythed earlier because it goes over earlier. All the cuttings go back onto the trees as mulch uh, and particularly onto the soft fruit just to keep, keep them free of... Um, you know, weeds and nettles. Um, and the scything takes us about mm, two... A total of a, no, probably a total of a day. Yeah, but we're old and it's knackering, so if anyone ever wants to come and help us... I'll tell you what, I love scything, and it is a rhythm, you know, with an Austrian scythe, but, my God, it's tough. It is. And so you, you can't... need cider to go with it. Yeah. <laughs> Which is lucky, because, of course, there's loads of apples, so you make cider. So, So... Yeah, a, another day for that, and then occasional mulching. Um, we, 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 uh, we mow paths, we mow a path through it yeah. um, once it starts growing. Um, so, around about May, June, I'll mow a path, and then I'll just mow the path occasionally, and it takes me about half an hour. And then the week, last thing is weeks. we grow comfrey underneath the trees in a circle, so does Martin Crawford, and then occasionally you get a hand scythe and you'll go around and just cut the comfrey down and, and dump it where you've cut it and put the minerals, the nutrients, back into the soil where the trees are. So you're growing your own mulch, growing your own fer fertiliser, and you're <coughs> growing it in situ. You're not carrying it even around the garden. So maybe that's a couple of days a year. That's probably that. it. Oh, we have to cut the, the hedgerow. That takes a day. So, so a week's work in a year. And I have never counted what the yield is, but the, the real work that takes the real time is the harvesting. Sometimes we can't harvest it all and the blackbirds get to it before we do. But, you know, we've got huge biodiversity. We don't mind feeding blackbirds. Yeah. My question about yield, actually, but... Okay, the question is, can we live off the land? I don't think you could live off a forest garden because um, it, it only crops up to a certain point in the season. Often peren the perennial vegetables are available when the annual garden, the hungry gap is out. You know, so, so we've got hungry gap, there's no annual veg, but you've got all sorts of things like Alexander's in, and, and Ranzones and other things in the forest garden. Um, I would think you'd need a fair bit of land to be 100% self-sufficient. So my preference and is always community self-reliance because not everyone's a brilliant veggie garden, annual veggie gardener and not everyone's a brilliant tree gardener. And we need mosaics of skills within communities that then develop networks that share resources. And then, of course, we can be resilient. But you might have to consider if with true sustainability where the protein comes from in the UK. And we may have to eat sheep sometimes. And, venison. and pigs and venison, venison and rabbits and pigeons and squirrels. <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> yes. Could you elaborate a bit more about why this is working in the... In the uh, tropical climates and why, why is it working, not working about the density, why, why is it not possible to have yeah. as much density as in the Yeah, tropics? because 
because we have much lower light levels. In, in the tropics, um, you've, got, you've got intense light and it, it means that the soils are really, really vulnerable and that you burn out and you constantly have to feed the soil in a tropical system. So that's why there's so much mulching system and getting nutrients back into the, the system. In a temperate climate, it's a bit like, it's much slower. So in the tropics, you could establish quite a significant growth in three, four years to even two. You know, you've got real fast cycling of nutrients and energy and photosynthesis because it's very intense. Um, but in cool temperate climates, it's all much slower. And we have these great climax species like oak that take hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of years to grow. Even, you know, things like walnut in our forest garden took, what, 15 years before it cropped? And that was quite fast. But then you're talking about something that could crop for hundreds of years. In the tropics, you're going to get crops, but it's it's much, much faster system. But because we have lower light, you, you have to space everything out. It grows much slower. Um, so you're, you're having to stack in space and time. So you're thinking, well, while this apple tree and this walnut tree and all the other larger trees grow, I'm going to infill with crops, uh, temporary ground cover and shrubs and currants that in 15, 20 years time will be shaded out and will be past their life. So you're just thinking in a different dimension, in, in a much slower way. But again, you know, we have a summer and the sun beats down and, and the soil is reasonably well covered. And so the soil is much more, it's a much more stable system. It's, it's harder to destroy a temperate ecology. And that's why us guys can still reasonably farm sheep in this climate but you take sheep farming to Australia, to that sort of brittle landscape, and, and it destroys that landscape and creates dust bowls far faster because it's a much re less resilient climate for that kind of treatment. So it's very, very different Australian permacultural systems to European ones. Yeah, I know, I heard. It's fine. Um, if you guys would like to go, you know, you're not held. <laughs> and I think there might be another session afterwards. Last question.